no bank wanted to work with me in the beginning. Um, I had these deals. I literally was like down to the phone book, calling people, strangers, saying like, listen, will you, will you look at these deals for me, see if this works? And I was getting told no and no and no all over again because I didn't have the experience and I was out of state. Those are my two biggest, uh, biggest hurdles. And so I posted on LinkedIn, like I was that desperate, like who can give me money? Like I, I know what I'm doing, I got these deals. And some random guy called me on a Sunday morning and said, hey, I've got someone for you, a bank, but it's gonna cost you two points. Uh, I'm a broker. I said, fine, let's do it. I've learned to, to kind of flip the switch and make real estate work for me versus me working for it. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, so that you can spend more of your time doing what matters. And at least in my case, that means traveling with my family. We spent 17 months abroad in Ecuador in 2017 and 18. And we're actually planning on taking another trip. I haven't told anybody publicly about this yet. This is the first time, but next year in 2022 and 23, we are started kind of the early stages of our planning to go on another long trip, probably 12 to 15 months, somewhere in there. And this time likely to Spain or maybe to Germany. We're kind of looking at both of those places in Europe and taking our kids with us again and letting them enroll in school there. But that is a very unique thing for me. The reason I love this show and getting to talk to you each and every week is I know there are lots of other things that matter to you. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm sharing these stories. And today I have a great episode where I'm interviewing Bree Schmidt. And the title of my episode with Bree is The 25 Hour Work Week: How Bree Schmidt Built a Lifestyle That She Loves. So this is a fun story. Bree started investing 10 years ago. She's from Chicago, Illinois. She also invested in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. And we talk about the story of her originally working a full-time job in a kind of a sales position with a lot of traveling and what the personal situation, I'm not gonna uh, give you the sneak peek on the, the story, but she had a, a moment in life, a, a life event happened that kind of changed her perspective and it drove her to take more control over her time, start investing in real estate, and really very quickly bought a lot of properties and then built up that portfolio and stabilized it to the point where she could eventually start working less. And as you'll learn, and this has been the case for me as well, this is both a financial exercise and also a personal development exercise to get to the point where you can or want to work less at some points. And that's not for everybody, of course, but she does talk about this. And I think it's a very honest conversation and a lot of helpful tips on the real estate side, a lot of helpful tips on the personal time management productivity side of things that I think you'll find very interesting. Before I get started with the main topic, I want to remind you of a few things. First, that if you're new here, be sure to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast player or on YouTube so that you don't miss anything. I have new episodes that come out every Monday morning. Also, each week I include show notes for the episode with links to anything that we referenced during the conversation. You can find a link to those show notes in the description of the podcast below. Finally, if you like the show, I always appreciate your support by leaving a review, particularly on Apple Podcast. And as a way of saying thank you to those of you who already left a review, I give away a copy of my book, Retire Early with Real Estate, each week to one person who recently left a review. Please keep listening all the way to the end of the, today's episode for this week's winner. Now let's get started with today's interview with Bree Schmidt. Hey, Bree, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great to have you. We uh, met briefly. We were at the Bigger Pockets conference and we were both on a panel and I was just very impressed with everything I heard and everything you've done and your story. So I'm just really excited to be able to, to share that with everybody listening here. Absolutely. And it sounds like we are both kind of in the same uh, phases of our investing career, which will make it for an interesting show. Yes, exactly. Great. Well, I, I thought it'd be good. I, I want to go back to the beginning here in a moment, but maybe just to give people a little context about where you are in the country and also just what your maybe talk a little bit about what your real estate and business looks like today. And then we'll go back in time from there. <laughs> it's kind of chaos. Um, and again, like none of this was planned. You'll, well, when we go back, well, you'll understand. Um, but I do a lot. So I have, um, I had just under hundred units, um, 31 properties within Chicago and Milwaukee. Those are the two markets that I invest in. Uh, I sold about 14 of my properties in the year before COVID. Um, so just had a couple closings right when COVID started. Um, I also own a brokerage firm here in Chicago. We're the largest boutique brokerage firm that specializes with investors. And I also plan a two-day conference in Chicago, uh, usually in spring, the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. 
So I do a lot within real estate. It has completely taken over my life. I like to say I used to be a normal person <laughs> that had, you know, normal interests like sports, um, all those things. And now my life for the past, you know, better part of a decade has been 100% real estate and kids. Yeah, we talked about that before we got on about the my, my kids are eight and 10. So a little bit ahead of where you are. But yeah, you, you add real estate and and kids that adds a little bit of fun chaos to the to the mix, right? But it's I'm so glad that I did the real estate first, because it's really allowed me the flexibility, the time um, with young children. I have a two year old and I'm seven months pregnant now. So I if I had my old life, um, I don't think I would be as happy as I am now. I would be so stressed, you know, working 60 hours a week. Um, so if, yeah, if you want to go back to the beginning, you know, I used to work in ad sales. Um, I spent 10 years working in advertising sales and I loved it. I used to travel, you know, I traveled 75% of the time all over the country. It was super fun. I had an expense account and got to go to nice dinners and, you know, uh, and in my twenties, it sounded like a great thing. Um, and I had really built up my career. I was in biz development and uh, management, and I had high aspirations of being a female executive within the corporate world. Um, really had no intentions of of being self-employed or, or slowing things down. Um, so we bought our first house, house hack about 10 years ago with really no intentions of it being a business. Um, we live in Chicago. So here, again, depending on the market or the area that you're in, about 60% of our housing stock is two to four unit properties, so small investment properties. Uh, my husband and I were, while well, we were about to get married, we were looking at, you know, hey, we should probably think about buying a house or a condo or something. And looked at these two to four unit properties were quite, you know, $100,000 cheaper than the single family house next door. So that was our plan. We'll buy a three unit property. When we need the space, we'll take out a door, move a staircase. Now we've got two floors. And then eventually we'll need more space and we'll just, you know, add a staircase down to the basement. Now we've got a single family house in 10 years. And over that time, we've had majority of our mortgage paid. So that was the original like plan was one house. That was it. Deconvert it down the road. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. I had never read a book about investing. I never talked to another investor. We did an FHA loan and we just looked at it as, you know what, like the rents, almost cover the mortgage like that's a win right we didn't take into consideration like vacancy repair capex you know none of that stuff um luckily you know we didn't we didn't make a huge mistake in doing it um it's still one of my most profitable properties but a few months after we bought the property uh, my father was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer and he was given you know six to nine months to live and my whole my whole world turned around um, you know, luckily I said, I had a very flexible job who allowed me unlimited time off to go take care of him. But in the end, you know, he made it seven months and the day that he died was the day before he was supposed to retire, um, okay. after almost 30 years of service with the post office. And when he died, we had already planned his retirement party and we had to convert it to his wake. And mm -hmm. it really, really resonated with me. Like, dude, he always talked about, you know, I'm going to retire after you get married. I'm going to retire after your brother graduates college. And then, and then we're going to go do all this cool stuff, you know, and like, we're going to go, you know, and he got none of it. And for years and years and years, he talked about it, but life happened and he didn't get to do any of it. So it really messed with me. And I had to really reflect on what I was doing with my life. I said, I was in my late twenties. You know, I was traveling a ton. I was working a ton of hours. Uh, business hours were, you know, the minimum requirement in my job. You were expected to work nights and weekends um, or be available to clients at all times. Uh, vacation time, you were still, like, you couldn't turn off. You were still expected to be available. Um, and was like, you know, I'm not even 30 yet. I've got another 30 years. Like, I've only been doing this for 10 years of my life. And I'm only 25% of the way through like my career, like till I retire, like I will not make it. Right. Um, so my husband and I sat down and like, we looked at a lot of different options. We, we really thought about our game plan of, Hey, like, what do we want? We want flexibility to be able to travel and still have an income. Um, you know, we looked at going to going back to school for coding, you know, cause a coder can do their job anywhere. 
Uh, you know, we looked at a lot of different things and at that point it had been about a year since we owned our property and thought like, Hey, this, you know, this real estate investing thing like this could also be, you know, another avenue to go into. Um, but like I'd been actually at this point, I'd been licensed as an agent for about 10 years. I did it when I turned 21. I absolutely hated it. Um, I worked with like retail buyers who talked about feelings and, you know, it didn't <laughs> feel like home. I don't like the paint color, like not my gig. I quit after like six months, something like that. <laughs> Um, but I had my license still and I always really enjoyed real estate. So we went shopping for more houses. Um, the next one we bought was a, another three flat that we just didn't live in. Um, and then a few months later we bought a, um, the worst house in the neighborhood, you know, uh, 19 had not been touched since the seventies and did a pretty major renovation on it. Um, so after the renovation project, which was terrible, by the way, um, again, like I had never read a book about investing, never talked to an investor, hired a terrible contractor, you know, moved into the house eight weeks late. We still didn't have appliances or a kitchen. You know, it was, I swear, like contractors just want to wear you down to the point where you're like, just take my money and get out of my house. Right. <laughs> um, so that we had one of those experiences, but we had, we were able to refinance. So we did like the burr strategy before it was a burr yep. uh, and pull out a substantial amount of cash. Um, it was pure blind luck at that point that I found bigger pockets. I was actually Googling a zoning question for my house and the answer came up on bigger pockets. And I found, I remember it was the week of Thanksgiving. I was still working corporate, like the week of Thanksgiving, like no one's working, you know, you have to like physically be in the office, but like everyone's off work. So I spent my entire work day on bigger pockets for like four days straight. And it got so in, in obsessed with it. Uh, it completely took over my life. Um, <laughs> so, well, that's so cool. So I, I wanted to pause there because there's so much good stuff. And one thing I just wanted to, you know, just talk about your your family story and losing your father, which I'm sorry to, to hear that as well. And but I just, yeah. I just I just think that's so such a so many people that I talk to who get into real estate it you know, real estate's interesting. Like you and I are real estate nerds. We love this stuff, but it, yeah. it typically has something to do with life. Like it's, it has yeah. to do, it has to do with a wake up call we get, whether it's a small wake up call or a huge one like you had. And, and I just, I just think that's such a point, important point to start with because, you know, I know for me personally, like, you know, my family being able to travel, I, I, I kind of did it on the real estate side. I grew a big real estate business and all of a sudden I had a wake up call saying like, what, you know, what am I doing this for if I can't have time to travel? And to, so it's very similar kind of in, you know, epiphany that you had, but, and I just, so I, I like that you emphasize that and that that was kind of your starting point to say, here, I have all these other options in life. I could be coding, I could do this, but real estate was the thing, was kind of the vehicle you saw to have this more flexible life, which is, was the end, end goal. Like that was the, you know, were, were there any particular goals you had, like saying, I would like to be able to take more vacation more than two weeks? Was it, I just want to have more time? Like, was there anything you were thinking at that point? Like, this is what I want to have eventually when you, when you first started this? I mean, all of it really, like that's what, that's the thing I find so, uh, so interesting about real estate investors. And but we, we met at Bigger Pockets conference a couple of weeks ago, you know, there was what, 1500 people there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was never a moment you weren't talking with someone, you know, pure strangers, because for most of us, this is a lifestyle decision. It's not just a job. Uh, there are, there are people that go to real estate for a job, but it's few and far between. Most of us choose this as a, uh, either through like a financial freedom, um, a financial independence or for lifestyle design. Um, and it's one of the conversations that you'll hear over and over and over again. So I always joke, like you can take 10 random real estate investors, lock them in a room with a case of wine and you come back 12 hours later and they're still talking, you know, they don't <laughs> so know true. each other, like, because we, the core of who we are as people is the same yeah. with real estate investors. It doesn't matter if you do flipping, mobile home investing, buy and hold, whatever. The core of who we are as people is the same. Um, and there is that commonality that makes us all kind of get along, um, which makes it really fun. Like I said, yeah. my husband, when I go to these conferences, you know, you start at like what, seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and it ends at like 10 o'clock at night and you do this for days on end. <laughs> and my husband's like, wait, wait, you pay for your own travel. So it costs you money to go to these things. And you're, you know, you can't do any of your other work because you're so busy there. And, but you, and you do it all for free. Like you don't get paid to do it either. Like, but I love it. You know, like those, those things excite me. 
Um, I get to learn about other people's experiences, things that they're doing outside of what I'm doing. I get ideas of how to develop my business and, and do better. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's really a very interesting, I don't know any other profession in the world that is like what we do. Um, but yeah, for some of us, it takes a wake up call, which sucks. You know, um, it sucks that it took that wake up call for me, but it was really about flexibility of controlling my life. You know, I was very controlled by work. Um, I had a different mindset where, and even the first few years of, of, of doing this, my mindset was very work first, personal time later, right? And it wasn't until a couple years ago that my, my husband kind of forced me to, to stop what I was doing and reevaluate things yeah. um, because we're, I was still working 60 hours a week. You know, I was still taking over my life. Like he would wake up in the middle of the night, I swear. And I'd be like running numbers in Excel at three o'clock in the morning. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, but like it was because it was it was on my mind 24 seven and it still is. But I've learned to to kind of flip the switch and make real estate work for me versus me working for it. Yeah, love it. Yeah, I've, I've had so so funny how similar some of these experiences have been from the yeah. spouse spouse telling you to slow down to the, uh, you know, waking up at one in the morning or two in the morning doing spreadsheets. I mean, I've, I've to totally been there. Like, all right, what am I doing in the, running these numbers on this 20 unit property that I'm about to buy? But, because if you think yeah. about it before you go to bed, then you can't yeah. stop thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I mean, so there, there's a positive and negative to that, right? And like, I love that this is yeah. like, this is a personal evolution too, that this is, you know, we all have our baggage that we bring right and I'm, we're both you know a lot of us are workaholics we love work and there's not you know there, there's a positive to that in that you get a lot done but the evolution it sounds like for you and also for me and my journey is that you put in the work you put it you pay your dues up front you yeah. buy some pro you buy properties and but over time the beautiful thing about real estate is that there's, it's very front loaded there's a ton of work up front and that drives some people from not doing it but then on the back end of that my understanding of your lifestyle now is that you take two months of vacation, you have lots of flexibility, you work what 20, 25 hours a week, you know, like those, mm -hmm. those, are, those are some pretty uh, attractive work situations now that you've put in the time and you've kind of been able to orient your life around what, what makes sense for you. Yes. And again, it's about the evolution. You're right. Um, in the beginning, there's no way I could only work 25 hours a week, uh, especially when we were in acquisition mode. So, after we had that cash um, is when I found bigger packets and realized there's a whole other world of investing out there that I had no idea about. You know, I didn't know about, I didn't know what notes were. I didn't even consider out of state investing, um, you know, syndications. There's, there's different avenues of doing this depending on your level of uh, desirability, we'll say. Right. Um, so I decided to do, you know, the Chicago market's quite expensive um, at the, you know, Nowadays, you're looking at $600,000 for a three unit property minimum um, in a decent area. So it would take a long time to replace your income. So my primary goal was income replacement. Um, again, I was still working, my husband was still working and it, we, we were trying to design this life around flexibility was the, the primary goal. Um, <clears throat> waking up, <clears throat> for me, the number one thing was waking up when I wanted to wake up. Yep. Um, which then God bless me with a two-year-old daughter who wakes up at five thirty in the morning. So <laughs> sense that of humor, choice, right? <laughs> that choice is no longer my own. Let me yeah. tell you. Yeah. yeah. Um, that one bit me in the butt. Let me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> her and her daddy are both morning people. It's insane. Yeah. Um, but like that was my primary thing. Like I want, like for me, making it would be being able to wake up without an alarm. You know, like letting my body naturally wake up when it is when it is rested, um, not being forced to be somewhere, do something, right? So that was one of my primary goals. Anyways, we right, found bigger pockets. Um, I looked at a couple of markets in the Midwest, um, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, and you know, I had no idea about any of these markets. So I literally just called. I found referral agents for investor agents. Uh, called three of them in each market. Went down there for a weekend. You know, and went out with one agent Friday, one agent Saturday, one agent Sunday and said, hey, listen, I'm going to spend half a million dollars. Why don't you take me out for the day and why don't you show me properties that you would buy and why? And it was a really interesting experience because I didn't give them any sort of criteria. Um, I really just said, like, this is what my, you know, this is what my plans are. And I got to learn a lot about the markets um, doing it that way and ended up the, the last weekend we went to Milwaukee 
the last day, the first two people took us to like the typical investor areas, uh, you know, which were C, D class, you know, run down cash flow on paper type properties. Mm -hmm. um, really wasn't comfortable with that. But the, the last day they took us to, uh, the, the different agent took us to a market that I felt very comfortable with. Um, it was, you know, bordering an A-class area. It had seen signs of development. It wasn't as strong as cash flow on paper as the other neighborhoods that we had seen, but the the tenants didn't damage the units. You know, it was solid working class tenants. It was something I was comfortable with. Um, so in the next, you know, nine months, I bought 18 properties within a two mile radius of that area. Um, so yeah, the you know we went through some trials and tribulations. That's a very fast growth trajectory. Um, it was like 60 something units in nine months. And the beautiful thing about the city of Milwaukee at the time is at closing, you have to pay a fee for a city inspection. And they come out as soon as you buy a property and they give you a list of code violations. So not only are you dealing with like taking over tenants, you know, transitioning a property, but then the city comes out and gives you a bunch of uh, to-do list and you've got 30 days to fix it. So it was a very, very chaotic uh, time period that, and I had to quit my job. Um, so it, when we bought our first five, so we did commercial financing, um, the price points in Milwaukee at the time where you could buy a duplex for like 60, you know, a three unit for 90, something like, like around that range. And the, the commercial lender for them, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze working with us or working with anyone really buying that low price point. Um, but if we were buying, you know, five properties at a time, we were spending around $400,000 at a time, then it was okay for them. So that's what we did. We had lined up, we did five closings, five closings, five closings, three closings. Um, and one of the most important things I learned with that experience was uh, understanding the bank's underwriting criteria. So I got very, very lucky. And I think I told the story in New Orleans, like, no bank wanted to work with me in the beginning. Um, I had these deals. I literally was like down to the phone book, calling people, strangers, saying like, listen, will you will you look at these deals for me, see if this works? And I was getting told no and no and no all over again because I didn't have the experience and I was out of state, which was my two biggest, uh, biggest hurdles. And so I posted on LinkedIn, like I was that desperate, like who can give me money? Like I, I know what I'm doing, I got these deals. And some random guy called me on a Sunday morning and said, hey, I've got someone for you, a bank, but it's going to cost you two points. Uh, I'm a broker. I said, fine, let's do it. And I worked, I did 18 loans with that bank off of that first couple thousand dollar fee that I had to pay him. But I learned what their underwriting was. It was one of the first questions I asked. So after that, it made it really easy because I knew everything that I, I was going to buy, I ran through their calculator and presented it to them in the way that they wanted it presented to them. So we were getting approvals in a matter of like three to four days. It was great. Um, and we were able to grow quite quickly by having that that partnership in place. Right. So I want to ask a couple of questions because that's that's sure. an amazing transition there. And w one of those is just so there's the practical side of getting the money, which that's such a good story about persistence, because, you know, you're, you're going to get no whether you're trying to buy properties from sellers or whether you're trying to get money, you're going to get some no's up front. The other that related to that was just to me, like the internal process that you had to go through and you and your husband had to go through to take the step, because that's a pretty bold step, first of all, to go out of state, second of all, to kind of say, I'm going to go put a bunch of money down. Like, was, was there any trepidation? Was there any like, how did you get over that, you know, internal dialogue we all have, right, to take some big, bold steps, like whether somebody buying yeah, one property or, or 10 properties? <laughs> I don't have that. All right. um, my daughter doesn't have that either. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, She's fearless, little two-year-old. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't have that. Um, I fully believe in figuring out what makes you comfortable and doing that. Um, so it was just a matter of comfortability, really. Um, again, I, I felt really comfortable with the area that we were dealing with. I felt really comfortable with the property types. They're all two to four unit properties, you know, close to downtown, very similar to Chicago. Um, so there's, there's very few markets in the country that have that, I call them like they're a dense urban environment, you know, mm -hmm. um, where people, it's common not to have a car, people rely on transportation. It's what I'm used to here in Chicago. So it really wasn't scary. 
Um, Cause I'm also a big believer in, you know, trusting your gut. So we talked about, you know, staying up at night. If there's a property that keeps me up at night because I'm worried about it, I cancel the deal the next day, hundred um, percent. I, that's one of my beliefs that I have about really anything. If anything keeps me up at night, worried about it, it's not the right decision. Um, I have to be sleeping like a baby or excited. Like I can't go sleep because I'm so excited about it. Uh, so it's like, you know, we, we did that a couple of times. You know, we obviously got inspections on everything and, you know, the inspections revealed something that I just wasn't comfortable with and no hesitation, canceled the contract and moved on to the next one. Right. Um, but it was really about, for us, my original goal, because then like at the time my husband was, you know, when, when's this going to end? Yeah. Because <laughs> this is, you know, literally taking over your life. Um, it's all you talk about, you know, you're doing spreadsheets in the middle of the night. Um, and I had said to him, like, so I, I ran some numbers and figured like 25 grand a month of gross rental income would would be our goal. That would be our stopping point because he he made me put a stopping point on things. Um, so we did that. And then I did actually thought it wasn't maybe enough. So I did another 10,000 uh, before I told him that it was enough. Um, so we did $35,000 a month gross rental income. And that's when we stopped buying personally. Um, for ourselves. And that was during that, that nine month excessive growth period. Right. And the things I heard, because a couple of really important points for new investors to hear, like you said, you, 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 you just took the action because first of all, you you had a, a gut feeling one way or the other, good or bad. But the other thing I heard that I feel like you, you built up some experience on those first few deals that when you went to Milwaukee, you saw that this market was, had certain qualities, had certain, you know, it's at the downtown, this is a attractive place. It's not a D, you know, it's not a dangerous area, but it's a working class area. Like you've ticked off a lot of things that I think for new investors, they need to learn about market evaluation that you apparently learned somewhere, you know, you picked it up, you were an agent. And so I, I found personally that the more you're prepared, the more you know your market, then that confidence which you exhibited and kind of have naturally as well that we can build that if we are willing to prepare and study it and for real estate it's that the market and the numbers like if you if you know your market and you know the numbers that go for it you're right? good I mean, yeah, yeah those, those, those uh, are the things that are going to hurt you 100 percent. and it's not something that you can determine by sitting at a computer and looking at statistics right um it pisses me off when people just you like when economists or whatever just use like blanket market statistics as like the only truth. Uh, again, like it just, it really depends. You know, take Chicago, for example, Chicago is almost 300 square miles. It is a, this, that's just the city. Um, it is a huge market. Um, even looking at zip codes in Chicago is too big of a data set to really know what's going on. The only way that you can know what's going on is boots on the ground. Uh, you absolutely, I mean, of those 18 properties we bought, I probably did, let's say, 35 property inspections. I probably offered on 50 to 60 properties and probably saw 200 properties um, to get to those 18. So, and I was not sitting at a computer just looking at, you know, numbers to decide what I wanted to do. It was total gut instinct. Um, and again, walking properties, learning your market. Um, it's something that as an agent, we also teach our clients. Um, so one of the tricks I always tell people, like if, you know, we get a lot of clients that come to us and say, you know, we're, we're looking at buying in the next 12 to 18 months. Perfect. This is an awesome time to get in touch with an agent and start to get to know things. Um, <clears throat> if you have Redfin in your market, go on Redfin, set up an alert, have it come to you once a day, not every single, like not every instantly, because those are too many emails. And once a day, put it in your calendar and spend 20 days looking through those listings. Again, in the beginning, you're just clicking through the pictures. You're not really sure what you're looking at. But let me tell you, after a couple of weeks of doing it, you'll start to notice things. You'll start like a property will come up and you're like, oh, wow, that seems really expensive. Or, oh, those rents are really low. Um, so like all of that, if you're not local to a market, all of that will just help you start developing your intuition, right? Um, so by the time you actually go look at properties, you've probably looked at a hundred properties online. You kind of have a good idea of what you're looking for, what you like, what you don't like. And then once you start walking these properties, like I said, you know, uh, halfway through our, our buying cycle, 
you know, I would probably spend less than 10 minutes in a house and walk away and tell you if I'd offer or not. Um, it was really that instinctual. Um, again, and I always tell people like, look at things that if tenants don't like it. You're not going to, or if you don't like it, tenants aren't going to like it. You know, it's like wonky bedrooms, you know, weird layouts, um, things that we deal with here. Like if the, if the unit is two floors, right? Like we get a lot of four bedroom, two bath, two floor units here, but like the master bedrooms on one floor and then the other three bedrooms are another floor. Well, if you have kids, especially little kids, that's a deal breaker for you. Yeah. You know, you don't want your little kids on a different floor. It's like, these are all things that like, if you're having doubts about it, so does a tenant. Well, that makes it then harder to rent. So now you're not gonna get market rents or it's gonna be take a longer vacancy. So again, it all comes down to, you know, figuring out like, and I would, would never buy a property that I would not live in personally. And I, you know, lower standards. Um, So like, it doesn't need to be granite, stainless, all of that, but it needs to be clean. It needs to be functional. Right. Like um, I always say like slummy units attract slummy tenants. That's the bottom line. Um, so all those things are consideration points. Um, yeah, I love it. It's, there's, is there homework that's done? It's, I used to compare it to like if, if you were an Olympic athlete training for the Olympics, you would train every single day. And as a real estate investor yeah. or somebody purchasing an investment property, you need to look have that Redfin search coming in every single day or the MLS search so that you can then pay your dues to make that instinctual 10 second decision once you get there. That's that's the yeah. dues you have to pay in order to, to get to that point. And you usually do get there. It just takes time. Yeah. You know, you can't expect to in a week you know, go, go find a great property. Like so for clients that we tell them like typically takes like three to six months, right. you know, of learning and seeing and just experiencing before you're even comfortable making an offer on something. Um, and that's just the reality. But once you do, and I was talking, like, it's the funniest thing. I've got clients who will look at probably, you know, 30 to 50 properties for their first one. And then once they've house half, they'll go to do a second one a year later. And it's always under five. We usually it's like the first three properties we'll see they'll make an offer on. It's the weirdest thing because they've already done that upfront work, yep. so it's already built up in their in their head of what they want. Um, and the second one goes so much faster. Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. So so you've gone through this process. You got into Milwaukee. You had your properties in Chicago. So you you just go through this like super acceleration period, and you're sitting there with the your number thirty five thousand gross rent. What what is that? you know, just roughly like, what does that mean for your lifestyle at that point? Can you pay for it? Is there enough income coming in net, net, net after paying all your expenses to, to pay for lifestyle? Can you, you have you already left your job? I assume at that point, like what, I'm just curious for people who are wondering, like what's the payoff at the end of all that? That was the number for my husband to be able to leave his job. Um, that's what we decided. So from the time I left my job in July of 2014, um, we bought our last property for ourselves in May of 2015. Um, and then he left his job in June of 2015. Um, but we still didn't travel. I mean, we did, you know, like it still took a while, um, uh, because then I started working with partners. So I've learned that real estate is kind of like crack. Um, <laughs> you know, once, once you get hooked, it, it's hard to get off of it. Um, so I started working with partners. So for from mid 2015 to mid 2016, I bought another 10 properties in Milwaukee with business partners. Um, and that's when we finally started to, to slow things down. We had a lot of, again, we had a lot of transitions, a lot of transitions with property management. Um, you know, and then it was working on efficiencies, you know, uh, really getting the, the pro portfolio stabilized, uh, working on systems, processes, all those things. Uh, we did still travel, but typically only for, you know, four to six weeks at a time. Um, but that was really the goal was to be able to go and and travel and do those things um, and not wake up when I, when an alarm told me to wake up. Yeah. Well, were there any particular trips or goals that you had that sort of like were alluring on the horizon? You're like, all right, let's get these systems in place so that we can go take this trip to some place. Were there any, any you can remember in particular? Oh, yeah. We did an awesome one. When was it? 2016, uh, we did six weeks in Europe, we did 10 countries and like 22 cities. Um, it was a really awesome. We did Morocco, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Croatia. Um, 
what else did we do? France, like that whole, you know, region, um, really like trip of a lifetime. It was awesome. Yeah. Cool. And, you know, travel, tra- like it's scary at first for those of you who haven't done it. And I'm sure as you know, like the first one you go, you go for like two weeks, right? Because you're scared to leave the business for longer than that. Mm. And then you realize nothing bad happened. And then the next one, you're like, well, we can do a month, you know, and then you realize something bad happened. Um, and, you know, again, if you have the systems and then it teaches you each time you go, right, if, if something does happen, uh, it teaches you what you need to work on for the next one. You know, so I was in Rome and I get a video from my property manager of our garage burning down. We had okay. just bought the property like 10 days before. Uh, we hadn't even gotten a chance to even like talk with the tenants and like transition things over. But apparently... <laughs> The guy cheated on his girlfriend and she took a bath to all the windows and then went to the gas station and bought those little red canisters of gasoline, poured it on his car in the garage and threw a stick of dynamite or something in there and like literally blew up our garage. And it was like 10 PM in Rome when I get this video, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? You know, like I'll email the insurance guy when I get you know back to the hotel. It is what it is. Uh, but like that stuff's just going to happen. Um, and one of the things that I, uh, yeah, BP, how Alrod talked about, what was it? Can't change it. Is that what he can't, was saying? Can't, you can't change it. Yeah. Like the stoic stoicism, you know, it's just like, mm-hmm. Hey, it is what it is, right? It is what it is. It's like, but that's yeah. seriously is like the best life mentality. Um, is you, someone once, someone very smart about 10 years ago told me you can only change, you can only control what you do and how you react to things. That is it. So everything else, like don't even waste your time upset about it because once it's done, there's literally nothing you can do about it. Hmm. Why waste your time? Like, so I just go strictly into like, you know, how to, how to fix it, right. How to, how to correct it, how to deal with it. Um, but it leads to a quite stress-free life because, you know, it's like once you have enough properties and enough tenants, like shit's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think this, I think this is a good point to talk about. I, I haven't talked about it much, but there, there's the practical side of how to solve that problem. All right, the thing got blown up. There's an insurance prospect, property process has to go through. There's a process of communicating with your tenants. But you had a you had a property manager there. You had people in place. Yeah. So some of that was going. So a lot of the stress we cause ourselves is, is and a lot of the p- reason people don't get into real estate in the first place is they imagine those kind of situations. That's that's pretty extreme, you know. Like, but they imagine hot water heaters bursting and water going everywhere in the middle of the night. They imagine a toilet. And all of a sudden, that's going to be such a stressful situation that I just don't even want to get into real estate in the first place. And I find that interesting because, I mean, yes, those are not pleasant, but it's like there are ways to solve every one of those problems. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's really just us. Like we, it's our not willingness to just kind of accept things and figure out how to do it that kind of keeps us from doing some really worthwhile. I mean, that's like a tiny, tiny percentage of the time that you and I have our real estate portfolios of those little situations. 99% of the time is beautiful, wonderful, you know, situations that 1% of the time is what keeps us sometimes from taking the chance, right? That's what reserves are for. That's what money is for, right? That's what proper planning is for, um, is for those sort of emergencies. There absolutely will be emergencies. That's not my first fire. I had another, I had a whole four unit burned down. Um, again, I was on vacation. Um, so just so happened like both times I was out of town. Um, but that one was my, I owned the property for maybe like nine months. Um, I was at a girl's weekend and we were just pulling into the parking lot for an unlimited Bloody Mary brunch. And I get a call from my property manager, the whole building burnt down last night, like Red Cross is there, moving tenants, like all their stuff is destroyed. And it was a Sunday morning. I'm like, well, there's nothing I can do about it right now. They've, they've got it handled. Like they're making sure the tenants, everyone was safe. Thank God. You know, they're, they're getting the tenants into temporary housing. There's nothing I can do, but really go enjoy this unlimited Bloody Mary bar right now. You know, cause like my insurance guy is out of the office. Like, what am I going to do? Um, but that again, that's what proper planning is for reserves, right? We, we build in CapEx numbers. We build in emergency funds. Um, to handle those things. There's, you know, real estate investing is not a uh, state, I don't want to say like stable business. Right. Um, at least for me, it always seems when it rains, it pours. You know, I can go six months without having any sort of major issues. And then for some reason, they all happen at the same time, you know, um, and I can go from having, you know, from having like a $20,000 expense one month because everything happened at the same time, but that's what reserves are for. So you've got to look at it that way. Like, this is what you planned for. This is why you set money aside every month. 
was to handle these things, um, you know, and then move on from it and then just rebuild your reserve fund. Simple as that. Yep. Yeah. And then the other thing you, that I really like that you pointed out is that you have a team member, you have a property manager. Like I've had a fire happen and in, in, I did a podcast episode on it as well. How that, how that happened. And I was actually in town, which is a little different, but it was almost as if there was nothing I really could have done any different. Yeah, my, my, pro- my property manager was was on site. They did ask me, and they could have asked me through a text message across the world. They said, can we buy some food for your tenants this evening? Can we help get them some blankets, a bed? You know, So we like we did some extra stuff that was the right thing to do, but it was just like, yes, like spend the money. Like that's, that's whatever, you know, it, it's just yeah. wasn't, it was something that if you have a good team, you have a good systems, this is a business. And so, um, and I, and I want to also just point out that like, so you, you went through that growth phase and I think like all of us, whether we're buying two properties or like you and I did, you know, get up to hundred units, you, you go through these phases of your career. So you went through this intense growth phase, acquisition, evaluation, you had to get it stabilized for a couple of years until you finally had, you push yourself a little bit and you now have some systems in place where you can start testing yourself going for the two week trip, the one month trip, the four month trip. That's exactly what I did as well. Um, but that's that's the part about real estate that is front loaded on the time, it's front loaded yeah. on the effort. And now, I mean, so maybe you, if you don't mind, like what what happened from there? Like you went on some of these trips, mm. you had these build. Where it, it didn't sound like you were acquiring a lot more after that period where you're buying with the partners. Like, did you just have kind of a stable period where you're maintaining what you have, or what what happened from there? Yeah, I haven't. I have not bought anything since 2016. Um, that's when we that's when the market, like the, the numbers that we were seeing, um, in the current market were a lot, our deals were a lot harder to find. Um, so we weren't getting the returns that we wanted. And that's when I kind of really wanted to focus on systemization of things. Um, so I was also going through a divorce, so I didn't want to buy anything in the middle of a divorce, probably not a smart idea. Um, and so that's when I really just started focusing on like, okay, how can we improve things? Um, how can I make that two week trip into four weeks? Um, and that's, you know, what I really focused pretty much like 2017 on. Um, that's also when I met my new husband, um, who I was, I was actually single for three whole days. Um, I was divorced for three days before I met my husband and it was our second date that we, he took off the day of work and we were spending it. Like it was a random Tuesday. It was 80 degrees in Chicago in the middle of February. Um, which never, never happened. <laughs> um, so he called in sick for work and I took the day off and he had a motorcycle and he took me on a motorcycle ride. We spent like eight hours together, but I was always on my phone. And he had stopped me in like middle halfway through our date and said, listen, I took time to spend with you and you're on your phone. So if you're not going to respect my time by being present and being engaged, then what's the point of doing this? And it really, you know, took me aback a bit. And that's kind of how I started reflecting on things. Like he's right. You know, I've been working 60 hours a week still, you know, I did all of this, you know, uh, we haven't bought anything in about a year at this point. Um, I've been really working on systems, you know, what else can I do? And that's when I started focusing on, you know, what were my new goals? Um, and my new goals were to get down 25 hours a week. Um, so one of the things that I did, uh, well, a Brandon Turner recommended this book, which was Getting Things Done. Have you read it yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love that one. Love so that much, on, my, on my shelf back there. <laughs> yeah. Um, really, probably the most like impactful book I've ever read. Um, coming from like a organizational standpoint, um, I have my to-do list every morning. Helps me focus. Uh, helps me. The book goes into like taking off your mental energy about remembering things. I literally write everything down. Like email so-and-so. That's on my to-do list. Um, so fantastic book. I highly suggest anyone get it, but I read that book and started using the the systems in it to help organize things and streamline things. <coughs> but also <clears throat> at this point I was, um, you know, I had a full-time brokerage business, um, as well as, you know, full-time, even with property management, it's still a, a lot of work to do. Um, and wrote down at the end of each day, I put it into an Excel sheet and wrote down what I did with my day. Um, what I did with my day, how much time it was taking me, um, like how much time it should take me and what, how much money it was making me. Um, at the end of the week, I would kind of reflect back and say like, okay, you know, I spent 10 hours this week trying to figure out marketing. I am terrible at marketing. I'm, words are not my strong suit. It sounds like a five, like when I write something, it sounds like a five-year-old wrote it. 
<laughs> proofreaders, like they just go to town on my work. Uh, I'm much better verbally. Um, but like, why am I like, why is it taking me five hours to write a blog? You know, it should not do that. Um, so now if I want to write a blog, I record it. I send it, I use a website called like Fiverr um, where you can outsource things. And I have them transcribe it into a blog article. Um, so now that five hours of work is maybe 30 minutes and it costs me 20 bucks. Um, so versus it was like the time it was costing me to be able to do that myself. Um, so things like that. So I started reflecting and kind of fine tuning my weekly schedule, um, working on things that generate me revenue, right? It's like with the agent side of things, that's dealing with clients, you know, um, talking with clients, you know, showing properties. That's where I make my money. Admin stuff contract processing, like I don't make money doing that stuff and I can easily hire a VA to do that for me. So outsource that stuff. Um, so that's what I really kind of did over the next few months was reflecting on the business, right? Making small tweaks, testing things out, trial and error um, to get to the point where, you know, now I spend the vast majority of my time on revenue generating tasks. Yeah, I really like this focus on time and getting things done. The book, you know, so it's about organization and systems, but it's really about, I think the subtitle, if I remember right, is like how to have stress-free productivity. Yeah. It's, it's not just about doing that, doing a, a to-do list just to do it. It's about this state of your life where you're less stressed. And I, I've been prone to it. I've been prone to having stressing myself out at work because you just, you, I kind of take things on, you know, like I just, I emotionally take them on and say, you know, if this, if it works, I'm happy. If it doesn't work, I'm not happy. You know, it's just like, that's a pretty natural process, I think, for a lot of us who are into our work. But I really found that helpful of, if you can get things out of your head, put them on a list, have a system, have a process. It forces a couple things. One is just you're more efficient. The other, but it sounds like you had a similar experience that I did is that you start looking at the list of things you're doing and like half of them, you're like, why am I doing this? Like the, yeah. this is kind of, this is, I'm just doing this because it's a habit and I've always done it when it's really not something I need. I could either eliminate it completely or I can outsource it to somebody else on Fiverr, especially today with so many networks of online, you know, work and people Fiverr working. is fantastic, man. Yeah, like, yeah. You can hire out anything. Yeah, do, exactly. Especially, especially with like marketing stuff, um, like logo design, like any of that. Uh, they do a thousand times better than I could ever do um, for much faster. But yeah, like for me, it's a, it's a centering moment, right? It's a stressing moment. So we're talking before the show, like this morning, you know, my daughter gets up at six. My husband's a morning person as well. He's crazy. So this weekend, we just had our whole garage was um, uh, spray foamed and they like re-drywalled it. So this morning at six, I get up with my daughter and my husband is already like trying to figure out the bike hooks to put up in the garage. I'm like, honey, it's six o'clock in the morning, you know? And like, we got the, you know, the pegboards and like we, the whole garage organizational system. Before I've had my coffee, he decides that he absolutely has to do this this morning. He's got no, like, he doesn't know what drywall anchors are. He doesn't know how to find studs. I mean, like, I'm like, let me, let me have my coffee, you know, but like, you know, he has to go do it. He started drilling through the freaking uh, heating vents because he didn't find it. Like, and then my daughter is in her shark costume at like seven o'clock in the morning, jumping on her trampoline. We've got an appointment at 830 this morning. I've got this podcast coming in at nine or 1030. Like it was just one of those mornings. And like, literally I had to go to my to-do list. Like, okay, my hat is a million places right now. And then it's Monday morning. I've got clients emailing me, you know, like think I've just got all, I don't take, I don't work weekends usually. It's like, I've got all this stuff to do. Like I literally had to sit down with my notebook and rewrite my to-do list this morning. And it really helps focus me. It's like, okay, none of like, these are the two things I absolutely have to get done this morning. The rest can wait till later. Like once it's all written down, I don't feel stressed anymore because I know it's written down and it will be taken care of. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a priority, but it's not a right now priority. But all that really helps me like de-stress. Whenever I feel overwhelmed, it's typically because I feel like I have too much to do and not enough time. And when I write it down and I reorg, I use highlighters, right? I categorize my to-do list. Like I'm crazy when it comes to my to-do list. Yep. But and I put everything that I like, I plan out my day, you know, like it's in my calendar, you know, like, so this afternoon I've got to do this thing. It's going to take me two hours to do it. Like I know I've, I've got time for it. It's been set aside to handle that this afternoon. So I'm not going to stress about it. So all that comes from the book, but yeah, it's been a, um, 
life changing. It's been really not stressful for the most part because of that book. Yeah. No, no doubt. I'm, I'm looking at my little, I've got my, I'm an old school planner guy, you know, like, so I have my, uh, you know, I like writing on paper. I just find it physically. Me like, too. 100%. You know, it, yeah. If I, I mean, I do have computer tools and I use Asana. I use some things like that for project management, but I just, for me, like, I love the, the, going back to this kind of Zen like quality that sounds like you have as well. It's like you, you go yeah. and you, you write things down. I'm away from my phone. I'm away from my computer. It's just me and this planner writing, you know, and just dissecting what I have to do. Like that's a moment. I have you know, to like, write down. I can't yeah. put it in a, yeah. <laughs> I can block off time in my calendar with for the tasks later. Like mm-hmm. the my to do list was from last week. So like Monday morning, just supposed to like redo your to do list. Like writing it down in a fresh piece of paper, like without all the cross outs from last week. Like there's just something about it. Yeah, I'm the 100 the same way. Uh, my notebook is with me everywhere. Um, I like live or die by my to do list. Um, uh, but it's one of the things they talk about in the book is like the mental energy, right? We spend so much mental energy, like oh, I've got to remember to do that. You know, um, by writing it down, it really takes that off of your your task list um, and you'll get to it later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I really like where this conversation has gone, Bree, because, you know, we talk about real estate. We talk about properties. We talk about income. That's probably the normal. Kind of, when we talk about financial freedom, that's normally where we start. And that's, that's a good place to start. Right. That's kind of the, the foundation. But ultimately, the evolution you've gone through and we all continue to go through is that you you get this income, you build this business. But it's also a personal transformation. Like we, we have this personal growth that happens and that we continue to have happen that really combines with that financial growth we have. And so I think that's just so cool to hear how that's happened for you and how the, the end result, it sounds like we all have things we want to improve though, is that you, you're living, you're, you're getting up in the morning, although your daughter's waking you up. Right. Uh, but That's you have, you, you have the flexibility to get up with your daughter in the morning instead of running off to some, to, to work that somebody else is kind of controlling your schedule. You have the ability to mark off on your calendar when you want to travel and you're in, you're doing these things like the brokerage, you're doing the, the, the other things you're doing because that's what you want to do. It's not because somebody's forcing you to do this. This is, these are, this is optionality. This is the choices you're making. So I think that's pretty cool just to how, how it all kind of comes together uh, with the financial, with the personal growth to, to, to paint this picture that we're trying to paint for, of our lifestyle. And the reality is anyone can have the life that they want, right? Um, you know, everyone, we call it like lifestyle by design, right? You can design your own life, um, but it's not without hard work, right? It's not without sacrifice. Um, and it, it's not something that can happen overnight. You know, I started this 10 years ago just in the last two years, has it really been the life that I wanted, right? The first eight years were building up to this, right? Working on this, um, like you said, you know, growth period and systems, right? Efficiencies, like that all takes time. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I can never go back to the corporate, the corporate world. Oh, yeah. like never going to happen again. Um, but it's, it's really an amazing thing when you get to wake up every day and do what you love to do. Cause it's not work to me. You know, it's, it's not, it's not like I wake up and it's like, Oh, you know, I've got to go do this. Um, it's, I get to do this. And so for me, the, the agent side of the business has been awesome. Um, cause again, real estate's like crack. So when we decided to stop buying, that's when I really kind of focused on the, the agent side of things. And that's when my brokerage grew. Like I get to help clients. Like I still, I still feeds my addiction. You know, mm-hmm. I still get to look at the properties and do the run the numbers and run the strategy and you know talk the rehabs and what improvements are going to happen. But I don't have to actually buy anything. Um, I, I get paid. I get paid to do this. Mm-hmm. So it's become a really fun thing for me to do to be able to uh, help others. A, but B, I get paid to do what I love every day. Yep. And if things change two years from now and you decide that this this isn't working for you anymore. You have the the foundation to say, all right, next, what's next? <laughs> what, what, what do I want yeah. to do now? But it develops, you know, um, like I said, in the very beginning, you asked what I did, you know, I do all these things. Like none of that was the plan in the beginning. You know, it all, it all just came naturally. Um, so I'm a big believer in, you know, people always ask me like, well, what's next? What's, what's your goals for the next year, next five years? I have no goal, hmm. literally none. Um, because I feel that when the right opportunity presents itself to me, I will be ready, right? Whether that be uh, more investment properties, whether that be a different vehicle for investing, a different avenue, um, whether that be a new business opportunity, 
right? I'm open to really anything, but I 100% feel that it will feel right and it will make sense to me and I'll be ready to go. Yeah, I find that very interesting because my, my own path, you know, I, I've had, you know, I have very specific goals with my income. Sound like you did too. I want to make 25,000, 35,000. And I had, I had very similar real estate kind of specific goals. Once I've gotten into this world, I, for me, it's not the realtor side of things, although I have my licenses on dormant. I'm more in this online space of making the podcast and YouTube and doing some online courses. I, I have very little goals on that. And it's kind of, sometimes I question myself, like, what, you know, is this okay? Like, it's just, it's kind of like what you're saying. It's very open that I don't know five years from now what Coach Carson's going to look like, this whole platform yeah. I'm doing. And I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Like that's, that's, it's a, it's a different place. It's a sort of a different type of goal making that I'm kind of, I'm following my intuition a bit and saying, this is fun. This is making an impact on people. I get to talk to people like Bree every day. You know, this is, this is a lot of fun and it doesn't necessarily have to be like this. This is where I'm going to be five, 10 years from now. So I don't know, exactly. just, I, that, that resonates with me how you're, you're kind of in a similar place. Uh, again, it's, it's not work when you love what you do. Um, and I think some of the best, the best businesses have evolved that way. Um, right. You know, just from, from natural progression, right? You, you have a passion for it, um, you know, and you attract passionate people. And then, you know, who knows, you could be doing a podcast and a, someone's got an opportunity that they present to you that might be a, you know, once in a lifetime investment. Like you don't know. Right. Very good. Well, Bree, this has been a lot of fun. We've talked yeah. about real estate. We've talked about time management. The The question I like to always close with my guests on to help my audience is you know, a, lot of, a lot of people listening to this, they're going to be at different stages of their financial independence journey. And a lot of them are going to be early on in their journey. And so I guess just, do you have a, a, a final piece of advice for people who are kind of looking forward and they're saying, all right, I want to accomplish some of the things that Bree's done. Do you have just a final piece of advice that would be helpful for them on their journey to financial independence? hundred percent trust your gut. Right. Um, I always feel that, you know, not every investment I've made has been a home run. Um, some have been terrible. Um, but at the end of the day, like I trusted my gut, it made sense to me at the time. And like, that's what's important. So, um, I, you know, I believe in not having regrets. Um, but that all again, has to come with being comfortable with your decisions. Um, so we talked about it before, you know, learn your markets, um, learn your numbers, learn your expenses, right? Because those are those vary from market to market, um, classes to classes. Get to the point where you are going to bed at night excited about making an offer on a property, um, not worried about how am I going to afford this? Or what happens if, you know, what if the vacancy takes two months to fill? Like, how am I going to pay my mortgage? Like, you should not be having those questions in your head. Um, and then just go for it. Well said. Love it. So, so Bree, I'm going to put some links to all of your, how people can stay in touch with you in the podcast links, but can you just let everybody know where they can stay in touch with you and hang out with you online? Uh, generally bigger pockets. Uh, I'm on bigger pockets pretty much every day under Bree Schmidt. Great. All right. I will put a link there and thank you so much for your time. Enjoy talking and look forward to connecting again sometime soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks Bree. If you'd like more details on today's guest or the resources that we discussed, you can find a link to the show notes for today's episode in the podcast description of your podcast player or in the video description on YouTube. And if you're new here, please consider hitting the subscribe button on your favorite podcast player or on YouTube so that you won't miss anything. I have new episodes that come out every Monday morning. This is also the time when I give away a copy of my book, Retire Early with Real Estate, to one person who recently left a review for the podcast. This week's winner goes by the username on Apple Podcasts, A. Fouché, that's F-O-U-C-H-E, if I pronounced that correctly, it was left back in July of 2021, and it says this, easy to understand and helpful. Coach has good information that he presents in a way that is easy for beginners investors to follow. His podcast seems to be more about providing helpful information than about talking himself up. So I'm glad that came across that way. Thank you so much for the review. Please send us an email at chad at coachcarson.com and we'll be happy to get you a copy of the book, Retire Early with Real Estate. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I have not considered your specific situation or risk. So before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. I'm your host for the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast, which is all about helping you invest in real estate, achieve financial independence, and do more of what matters. See you next time.